Lois Combs Weinberg, 67, May the 4th, 2011, Hindman, Kentucky. I'm the teacher. Matthew Kevin Johnson, 38, May 4th, 2011, Hyman, Kentucky, and I am the student. Matt, it's been many years ago since you were my student. Oh, yes, many years ago. It was. Uh, what's your first recollection of where we were and um, the tutoring that went on? Uh, I, remember, uh, I remember actually being in the... I think is the resource center at Hyman there, and uh, we was doing night school. We were. Yeah, and uh, I remember having you as a tutor there, and it was all all of it was kind of new to me and stuff like that, and uh, and I remember uh, I remember having I remember having you as a tutor. And why were we? Um... Why were we in night school, of all things? You'd already been to school all day. So had my children. And uh, there we were at the Resource Center um, for three and a half hours every week, uh, once a week. Yeah, we, um, a group of parents and stuff realized that their teacher, um, that their, their, uh, their parents there, I mean, their kids there uh, had dyslexia. And, and that's the reason that we was there, because we had dyslexia, and we had to take the time out outside of school at, in, at night there to just, to just get some extra work in for the dyslexic students. Well, now, I know and you know that dyslexia is, it means faulty language. Um, schools teach language. Schools teach English, reading so how come we had to do three and a half hours extra every week? <laughs> it, it's a lot of times uh, the, the schools just didn't really recognize how to teach us. It's, uh, it's like that we can learn if we have the proper tools to learn. And uh, we just had to take time out to present, you know, how we learn, how we learn a little bit differently than what the other public schools were doing. Well, we as parents had been trained to teach differently because we realized that we had bright students, bright children uh, who needed to learn differently. And um, we were actually blessed to have been given the, um, the tools of the Orton-Gillingham um, method in order to right. work with um, our sons and daughters in this uh, after-school tutorial. Do you remember some of the techniques that we used? Oh, yeah, I remember definitely a lot of the <laughs> techniques we'd use. We'd, we'd always say a sound, and then we'd put our hand down. We had this memory board, and then we'd sound it out, and then we'd write it out on this memory board, and then put our hand down and sound it out again, then come all the way back to the first part of the board mm -hmm. there. You know, it was just, I remember the memory board for sure. Say, spell, say. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. And the multisensory, the multisensory right. really was involving not only your saying it and hearing it uh, but and visually looking at it, but also the sense of tactation and the kinesthetic sense of, of actually writing the letters on that memory board. Right, right. And, and what the neatest thing was that you could actually see it kind of on the memory board as you was writing it there. You could actually see that letter being formed. Mm -hmm. Wait, so can you, can you like, give me an example of what a word on the memory board would be like and what that say, spell, spell, say would be like for a specific word? Well, let's, say, let's take the word um, tap. Say, spell, say. Yeah. Uh, basically, tap, and then you would put it on the memory board with your finger like you was drawing it out. T. T. A. A P. Tap. tap. And then you would come back over. Tap. T. A. P. Tap. Repetition is really important. And the interesting thing is, Matt, you know, we all knew that you were smarter than having to go through this kind of basic um, language training. But in order to read and utilize those higher level thinking skills, you needed to be able to hear the sounds 
and associate them with the letters that you were actually making. Right, right. That really helped me out with association there because it just really helped to speed up my reading and writing. Well, and now you're, uh, you've you just finished a master's program in physical therapy. Is that not right? No. No, uh, actually getting ready to apply for the Ph.D. physical therapy program at UK. I see. Very good. And so um, you've come a long way from being 10 years old when I was tutoring you one-on-one. Right. And making sure that you paid attention, look at me, right, <laughs> and remember right. all that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And if we saw you flagging, we'd stand up yeah, or yeah. we'd sit down. And um, tutors also, um, we were all in the same room, remember? Right, right. Paired right. up, paired right. up. And your mom was supervisor, right. director, um, and was willing for there. years yeah. to take on that responsibility yeah. because she believed in you. Oh, yeah. Uh, she believed in Jonathan, your brother. Right. Uh, I believed in my sons right. who were participating. Oh, yeah. And, a, yeah, my, my mother, she just believed in every student. Uh, she just believed in every student that would come through there, that they were smart and they're going to learn. They just had to have the proper tools in the proper way of just presenting it to them. Right. Jean was awesome. She was, you know, she was tall and Kids respected her. She was gentle. Yeah. She was gentle as anything. But she made sure that we followed the stru- structure uh, of how the lessons were to be presented, that um, tutors were trained well, and uh, she just worked nonstop. I remember she was the treasurer. Yeah. I never did know that what the bank account was all about, but we had just about $500 because we just volunteers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were all volunteers, and um, and we didn't tutor our own children. That's why I was tutoring you. We tutored somebody else's child, and then we would rotate uh, from week to week. <laughs> so you had somebody different every yeah, week. Yeah, you had somebody always every week, just somebody different, you know. And, and, you know, and it was just, it was positive, too. They made it such a positive way of learning too they would always just you know bragging on you and just felt like you was a part of something well we tried to do what we called on give what we called honest praise right you know but we know that for children to learn they need to be emotionally secure and reinforced and so we knew you were working as hard as you could work right and um our job was to make sure you were engaged and that you went through was the lessons sequentially and got that foundation that's given you the wings to fly. Right. Um, and how happy your mom has been. Yeah, oh, you, yes. You know, she's not with us now, and we yeah. lost her a month or so ago. Yeah, April, yeah, April 5th. But she, um, she was the rock that um, kept you boys coming and... Um, And I wonder, you know, she, I wonder how much you told her about what was going on at school. I I was able, uh, pretty comfortable to tell mom what was happening at school all the time. It was like that uh, if I had problems, it seems like, you know, uh, you know, it's like I would know it when I say it, but putting it down on paper was totally different story for me Mm -hmm. and you know i would let her know that you know hey i'm I'm just not getting it like the other students and i started finding that out as early as first grade Mm -hmm. when i started just realizing there was a little bit of difference and then in second grade and as it progressed with me i i started seeing a big difference that you know there were certain areas that i was good at Mm -hmm. like the mathematics but then the reading i was i was just falling behind and um, in school, did you ever have any uncomfortable moments? Oh, yeah, I had a lot of uncomfortable moments, you know, when you would get called out to read something out loud or, you know, you would get up to, you know, do something on the board because, mm-hmm. you know, it was just so hard for me to write on a board. You know, there was no letters and stuff. And then also just being criticized by teachers and stuff because you couldn't, do this or you know why are you lazy and you can't do this and you know you're not doing your homework you know it wasn't a a lazy thing it's just I didn't know how and you know I knew I was smart but it was just like I couldn't at the time I couldn't do it Mm -hmm. the way they were showing me to do it 
was there ever any sort of um, bullying by the other kids or teachers that used uh, as far as yeah sometimes you know you would get called some names now teachers has has called some names too like, such you as know, being a dummy mm -hmm. uh lazy mm -hmm. you know uh you're you're just not interested in this you know you're just wasting time it uh uh, he actually had one teacher, you know, kind of making fun of dyslexia, mm. you know, just because, you know, they didn't know anything about it. What's your theory as to why they didn't know? And, you know, that was several years ago, Matt, but I must admit that I talked to parents yesterday, today, most every day of about children who are still having these kinds of problems. Uh, what's your theory as to why the teachers didn't understand? I think why the teachers no. uh, didn't understand is because they just couldn't connect with this child. They they was just taught one way of teaching, mm -hmm. and they just didn't know how to recognize dyslexia or even how to deal with this child. Um, it, it's just that, uh, you know, whatever works on the majority is basically what they did in public schools. You know, they mm -hmm. wasn't identifying each one's strengths and weaknesses. Exactly. And as you've gone through your education, has it gotten easier? You know, I still, I, I still have my problems, but it has gotten easier because of the technology. The technology with the computers, digital books, um, visual things, videos. Uh, I'm a visual learner. I really like visual things. And as technology has progressed, it has just made learning easier and fun you told me one day about uh, using the ipad oh yes and tell tell about the um the website that you go to to get your books downloaded oh yeah course smart there i go to course smart and i get my books downloaded and uh, uh you know they got the ability to you know you can you can change the font to it you can change the context of it you can you can make it bigger you can make it smaller you can actually highlight and uh just just being able and on my macbook pro i'm able to highlight everything and it will read for me wow and can you change the color oh yes you can change colors you can change your background from white to black because a white background seems to have a little bit of problem with dyslexics they kind of like a black background because you know mm. that way there's just the, it seems like the white and the contrast of it is just, it just interferes and makes the, the letters more pulse or move mm -hmm. even more than, than a black background that's actually just kind of absorbing the light and you can actually see the letters. I've heard students through the years talk about uh, that the letters actually moved on the page. Describe what in, yeah. As you have looked, it's it's almost what? like uh, what I describe to people is almost kind of with me is like a type of a pulse, like a heartbeat, but the letters are kind of moving and pulsing sometimes. Sometimes those letters will actually, as as more fatigue I get, mm -hmm. will actually start to almost like they run off the page or turn around backwards. But a lot of times it's like pulsing mm -hmm. even sometimes with like a light almost like pulsing around the letters mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like that with the technology is that on the computers you get less of that you get less because mm -hmm. of the graphics on the computers mm -hmm. and stuff and and the contrast of the computers matt you don't wear glasses don't wear contacts so we're not talking about an eyesight problem right no no it it's uh you know it's it's a dyslexic problem. And like, I, like I've always said, you know, dyslexics can do anything they want to. We just got to have the right tools. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't give the wrong tools to go work on a car that you know these tools ain't going to work. Same way with dyslexics. Once they have the right environment, the right tools, they're able to sell big time. I remember in summer schools and stuff gaining four or five years on my reading and just... <laughs> One summer, my first summer, I could not cursive write one letter. And by the end of six weeks, I was writing everything. How many hours brown. a day did you go to summer school? Oh, uh, it, was, it was close to about a nine-hour day. 
And how many weeks? Uh, six weeks. Um, and how many summers did you go? Oh, I'm, I know that at least, you know, we went like six or seven, maybe six or seven, eight summers. Right. Of course, this was a specialized summer, summer program based right. on the Orton-Gillingham teaching methods. Uh, it was, it's still conducted here at the Heinemann Settlement School. Um, but tutors were actually and are still hired to work these long hours yeah. and, and do very intense work. Right, right. This is not, uh, there were not a lot of breaks, right? No, there wasn't a lot of breaks at all. <laughs> to be honest with you, it was almost, uh, when I went to the first time, it was like, line up, let's get ready to work. It was more positive, but hey, we're going to do this. This is a working environment. We're going to be positive, but we're going to get it done, too. Well, <laughs> you, if you gained four or five years in reading, there had to be a lot of actual um, intellectual work done and interaction of student and tutor to, to learn, to learn that much material. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and to really reinforce it in, in, uh, inside your head. You know, one of the techniques uh, also was, is called mastery. And unlike what happens, I think, in a lot of schools of, of materials sort of being sprinkled and bright kids just sort of absorbing it and all of a sudden, you know, knowing everything, for dyslexics, um, we know that the actual direct instruction that's done in a sequential, structured kind of way is what really puts the foundation uh, out there so that Students who do have uh, a high intelligence can actually then utilize written material. Even on the computer, you're reading a lot, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm reading a lot. I read, I read every day and stuff. I was doing research and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I have no problem with it. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I'm like everybody else. I have to take a break and stuff. <laughs> and sometimes I have to get motivated just like everybody else. But... But with the proper, I've, I've always said this, with the proper tools and understanding and, you know, in the knowledge, you can do anything you want to. It may be hard work. It may be different than other people, but you can do it. Well, I can hear your mom. I can hear Jean <laughs> drumming that into your head oh, yeah. year after year. And mom, mom was a big supporter of not only uh, me and my brother, but, but every student. Uh, she really did. She... Uh, uh, she just believed in every one of them and, you know, and just <laughs> loved every one of them just like it was her own. And all through the years, even in the later years, she worked um, as director of the GED program in adult education. Right. And it, she had some pretty tough students. Oh, um, yeah. She, she, she had some very <laughs> tough students. But uh, maintained, uh, maintained a sense of respect for them and therefore they respected her. Yeah. But um, one of the things that I, I was curious about was in your, in your memories, um, how did you view those of us who worked with your mom and uh, who directed the program? Did you think we were big ogres and that we <laughs> were just um, being mean to, to keep you kids after school and make you work hard? Well, you know, as a child, you know, at the time, you know, you say, oh, I don't want to go to night school. But no, they believed in us. They really did believe in us. And to be honest with you, in that three hours, I felt so much better than I did a whole year in public school because mm -hmm. it's just like they believed in you and you was actually accomplishing something. And you felt good when you left there. Right. You felt like that, yeah, I'm, I'm not as dumb as they you know, I led on to be in public schools and stuff, and I can do this. Mm -hmm. So you kind of felt good about yourself, and, and knowing that, you know, the other parents and my my mom was there to support just just made that reassurance that, hey, you know, they believe in us, and, you know, we're going to succeed. And succeed you have, <laughs> and succeed you have, as have many of the other students that we have worked with through the years. Um There were there were times when my my sons were the most rebellious, I think, <laughs> and I, I've always always been envious um, 
of your mom because you and John were so much better behaved than my children. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm so glad that, that mine didn't influence you in a negative way. <laughs> well, I think my father had something to do with that. <laughs> we know we, we would get it home if we, <laughs> if we didn't straighten up. <laughs> well, it worked. It, it really worked. What's the worst memory you can, um, that comes to mind as you think back on your, your academic uh, years? As far as related to public schools, it's just uh, failing. Mm -hmm. uh, failing a lot, knowing that I know, I know how to read, you know, in my own way and stuff, but it just, you know, when you start, you know, getting the scores back when the teachers hand it out, just, just seeing that, you know, that you would, you would get an elf or you would fail and stuff and just like, you know, um, and, you know, knowing that you did put that work in and knowing that you was prepared, but you you kept us failing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And then finally you just get that attitude, well, you know, you know, this is how it's going to be. So, mm -hmm. you know, I might as well, you know, quit trying as much, you know, just have a little fun around here, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's why dyslexics sometimes they kind of become the class clown or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. or an actor uh, because acting like they do know what's going on. And that's two of the very common things, and I played both of that. <laughs> <laughs> sort of taking on those masks. Oh, yes, yes, very much. It, uh, because, you know, you wanted to be just like the other kids. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you would, as I, I could say for myself, I would even look at them and say, well, how are they doing this? You know, what are they doing, mm -hmm. you know? And I would try to do stuff that they was doing, but it just it just didn't work out as well. Well, you were lucky in one way in high school. Well, all through grade school and high school, you played football, and of course, you were a football star. So you had that to fall back on, right? Uh, even when schoolwork wasn't going quite. Yeah, so well. it's. Uh, I've always used athletics, and and also, you know, I've been involved in weightlifting and powerlifting and strongman for many years. And I've always used that working out as kind of like, you know, getting rid of the negative energy and, mm -hmm. and something to really look forward to that I was succeeding in pretty well. Uh, and that's what helped me in grade school and, and high school is because I did have that football and I knew I had to get good grades and, and I knew that I had to just, I had to really try because, you know, I wanted to play football. But, you know, the academic side was like, oh, you know, it, it was just kind of a letdown, to be honest with you. Matt, was there a particular turning point for you where, where either in summer school or the night school where things started to click and you kind of felt differently? I, I did. I did. Uh, in the summer school programs, most definitely, I felt like it was starting to turn around. As I got an older uh, in high school, it it was like some of the failures started coming back. Mm -hmm. And then I actually got a tutor there, Ray Sloan. And he, mm -hmm. he just personally just tutored me. And he was a high school teacher. And he was just kind of reinforcing the things that mom told him to do with me. And it just started clicking. I, I've spent more, I spent like three to four hours sometimes at night wow. as a tutor right. after school and practice, you know, uh, just, in, you know, just studying and stuff. But I felt comfortable there because yeah. Yeah, I was getting it. <laughs> you were getting it and he was a great guy. Yeah. And, and was it in all subjects, Matt? It was in all subjects. In all subjects. And in all subjects, yeah. Man. I had him my freshman, sophomore year and around my junior year, he started uh, around the end of my junior year, he started tutoring me and tutored me all the way through my senior year. So the motivation, you, you've, you've been able to maintain, even at your lo lowest moments, right. a level of motivation right. that carried you, that kept you moving. Right. And then um, a few years ago, uh, somehow you went to a doctor or was, I don't know how that happened. As, as, I, as I went back to college, Oh, for the third or fourth time, <laughs> uh, I was um, uh, one of my instructors there. He just kept saying at, at the college, he just kept saying, you need to get retested. You know, you need to get retested for dyslexia. And so we can have this on record and stuff. And it, it had been so long since I've, sure. I've been tested for dyslexia. And then back in 07, 2007, 
I got retested for dyslexia and came out that not only did I have dyslexia, but I have ADHD. And about 40% of dyslexic students also have ADHD. Right, So right. you're in that 40%. Right, right. And then he recommended... Yeah, he, he rec- yeah, recommended additional. some things. And, and, uh, and once I was able to regulate the ADHD, I went from being considered in the physical therapy assistant program to being considered into the doctor program. <sighs> and, uh, you know, it just, uh, I, and that, then a lot of classes came that I started selling in physics, you know, chemistry, you know, uh, a lot of things that just started clicking with me and stuff, and I love it, to be honest with you. I would, I love physical therapy. I always wanted to do that all my life, but uh, I like physics too. I remember your mom um, a year or so ago talking about your your physics class and how you would take a big whiteboard in the kitchen and work out your physics problems uh, on that whiteboard. Oh, yeah. And she was just so excited and so amazed that, you know, here is is Matt who struggled in grade school and is loving physics. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was just such a... Uh, an exciting breakthrough, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, once I started learning a lot of physics and stuff, you know, we'd watch a TV program or be going down, and it got monotonous because I would tell her actually how things work, and she'd go, oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Do you have to tell me everything? (laughs) But what a a joy for her and what a delight. yeah. Yeah. Um, to see to see you getting to that level of conceptual thinking that she always knew was there. Oh yeah. And to see it really breaking through in a way that uh, allows you to have a, a very satisfying career ahead of you. Right. Right. Well, you're already doing right, physical right. therapy at some level, but. Um, right. Right. It's uh, yeah. I mean, it's even kind of amazing to me. Uh, once that I got the ADHD thing regulated and it was just like it just opened up a new world Mm -hmm. and that I was really starting to learn and really starting to really understand higher um, concepts like physics and stuff like that and it was just like you know it was just like opening up a new door a new Mm -hmm. world to me light bulb went on right I always seen um, a lot. A lot of the parents uh, that were involved. My dad was a dentist. You know, my mom she had a master's degree, and uh, a lot of the parents uh, that was involved in the dyslexic program there, they had higher education, and I always wanted that for myself. And that uh, I just I knew that I could do it, but sometimes I would shy away from it. But uh, I just knew that I I could do it. I wanted to do. It. And I just feel like that uh, I just kept motivating that I always said to myself, I'm much more than this. I'm much more than this. Even at my lowest times and stuff, when I decided to go back to school in 2004, I I just decided I'm better than this. I want to do better. And uh, with all the failures and stuff, it's just that, you know, I kept failing and failing and failing, but I would just keep right back up and going keep right back up and going at it and uh i just think that that's what you need to do you know there's going to be times that you're going to fail there's going to be adversity and stuff but you just got to keep on going you got to keep on going and keep a positive attitude even with your family because it really doesn't matter how how many times you fail how many times you get knocked down how many times you get back up and try and try and try again i can hear that coming out as you do physical therapy with very difficult people in the future and and even now um that's the kind of perseverance that people need to to have if they're going to overcome physical disabilities right right. but you've overcome something um that nobody can see right. nobody can see all anybody could see was that you were a bright kid you came from a good family you had every opportunity and you were failing right what would you say to uh, a, a parent of a first grader who 
um, a first grader that was struggling with reading? Um, w one of the things that I would say is, listen, don't deny the problem. Acknowledge there's a problem and then go out there and find out what that problem is so you can get it fixed. So many parents are, they're so worried about their kid being different or something wrong with them and stuff and denial comes in. No, that's, they'll just grow out of that. Mm -hmm. It's best to get them when they're young. So that's why the sensory and everything is just, is, is just going wild where they can able to learn. And uh, I would just tell them, listen, acknowledge the problem. Get the proper tools for the kid, get him properly diagnosed, so that way it can help the kid out, help him grow. You know, it's just, it's a fact of it is, is not knowing that you have a problem and then you don't acknowledge it is, is just disaster. So um, if, if you were giving advice to um, a seven-year-old who... Um, was being punished at school for not doing their homework and not getting finished with tests, not doing well on their multiple choice on their even their uh, standardized testing. What would you say to that little kid? I, I'm just I would just say is that I understand what you're going through because I've been there, and what I would say is you just have to you, you just got to try to keep positive you just try to keep happy even though that you're failing sooner or later you're going to be able to get the help that you need so in the proper tools so you can be able to succeed it's it's awful because i've been in that myself you know failing and failing and then pretty soon you just think of it well i'm done and uh one of the reinsurance to that seven-year-old is you're not done you're very smart probably one of the smartest ones in there. You just have to do stuff a little bit differently. And and just making that reinsurance to really realize that, hey, they are smart, they're a part of something, and they're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit different. It might be a little bit harder, but you can succeed. What do you tell a parent? What do you tell a parent who doesn't have the tools and the resources available and don't really understand um, what you just said to the child, really. They're not, they're not sure that it's not, um, that, that their kid just isn't trying hard enough. Well, one of the things that uh, you just, you got to reassure the parents is that the kid is probably trying. And one of the things that I've always done with this is just tell my story tell my story of what I had to go through and that, you know, many people thought I was just, you know, I, I was slow. That was it. I was just really slow. Mm -hmm. And it's awful to feel, you know, to have yourself as labeled as slow. Mm -hmm. But I would go with my story and what I had to go through and then just properly just direct them, you know, well, this is what you need to do because, you know, I, we've uh, some of us older dyslexics has already laid out the groundwork, and it's going to be not as painful as it was for us because back then they didn't even they didn't even think that dyslexia even exist. Who are some of um, who are some of the famous dyslexics that you've read about or thought about or? Oh, uh, uh, Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Henry Ford. Um, uh, Thomas Edison, uh, there are so many out there, uh, Abraham Lincoln, there's so many out there that, that just think so differently that were dyslexic, but was able to, able to succeed because they did, they was different. And a lot of inventors and a lot of scientists was that way, you know. It, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs. Exactly right. Um, Probably there are more millionaires or billionaires in this country um, who are dyslexic than who are not. Oh yes, um, that's they've done a study um, from the um, I think it's the Cass School in London 
of entrepreneurs in both London, in England and in the United States, and there are more dyslexics entre- you know, who are entrepreneurs in the United States than in England. Right. Um, it, Charles Schwab is one that comes right. to mind. Right. Um, he knew about the money. Yes. Okay. Um, what are you most proud of now? Well, I'm most one of the things that you know when I graduated with both my associate's degrees there, first I was very very proud of that. I was very proud that I felt like that my life was going in the right direction. Um, I, I was proud to have the parents that I did, the support from my mom and dad. Uh, I, I was just, I was so happy at this point in my life that I was succeeding when a lot of times that I failed, failed, failed. But now, you know, the failures, you know, every now and then they still happen. It's easy to deal with because I know what to do now and having that drive to go forward. Well, I, I know that your mom was extremely proud. I mean, I'm sure your dad is too. But um, I wonder uh, if you can see a future in this area of eastern Kentucky for um, how dyslexic students can be better served. That's a hard question. I think... Uh, I think that just people just really needs to be informed. They really need to understand about it more. Um, we, we've always wanted, you know, the dyslexics around here to succeed and have their own place and be able to be able to just really just learn. Uh, I do see it. It's going to take a lot of work, you know, and it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of teamwork. But I really do see it. I think I think a lot of people are coming around to understanding dyslexia a little bit more. One by one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what it is. It's just one by one, and uh, just slowly, just telling your story and trying to trying to convince people. Hey, you know, this is a good thing. And that's who we see um, as they bring children back to be screened. We see uh, grandchildren. We see children. Um, of former students. Uh, we see family members of former right, students, right. Uh, some of whom uh, tell about uh, what's going on, and they come from far and wide. I, I had a second cousin who came last last uh, summer from um, Owensboro uh, to eastern Kentucky to, be, um, to go to the summer school, and it just made such a difference. And he, at the end of the summer, could read cursive writing. Yeah. Nobody ever. It didn't. They didn't even know he couldn't read cursive writing. Right. Until right. Uh, he informed everybody that now he could. Right. Right. So. Um, you just. You just got to be patient. Um, you got to be positive, and you just got to. People just got to realize that dyslexics they're going to fail, but just keep them positive and knowing that they can just come right back at it and try, try harder, because like I said, it doesn't. No matter how many times you fail or fall down, it's how many times you get right back up get with a new attitude and say, I'm going to try again. Matt, I'm, I'm wondering, in reflecting and in, in telling your story, and your mom sounds like she's such a big part of it, um, is there anything you would want to say to her right now? <laughs> That's, uh, I, I really... I really love my mom very much, even though that uh, me and her would fight like cats and dogs, but she was always the the biggest supporter of it. And always, you know, made me believe in myself. And, uh, you know, uh, she was a very good mother for for me and my brother, and we, we had all the support that we, <laughs> that we ever needed and more. Well, I'm just glad we've had an opportunity to sort of um, let our hair down <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and talk about some of the hard times and some of the good times. Right. And um, 
I just want you to know that I really appreciate your taking time to come do this. Oh, and, thank you very much. Um, and tell it like it is. Tell it from your heart and um, sort of put it out without shame, without um, denial or camouflage and, and uh, for the good of the world. Oh, yeah. It just, the story needs to be out there, you know, for other dyslexics. If it helps one dyslexic, then we've done our job. We've done our job.